And let's begin this hour with President Biden's warning to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The two leaders spoke by phone yesterday for about 30 minutes. It was their first conversation since the Israeli airstrikes that killed seven food aid workers in Gaza. The White House says the president told the prime minister Israel needs to change its approach to Gaza with immediate action and that future support for the country from the United States depends on them doing so. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who was on that call, gave more detail about the conversation yesterday while at NATO meetings in Brussels. The president emphasized that the strikes on humanitarian workers and the overall humanitarian situation are unacceptable. He made clear the need for Israel to announce a series of specific, concrete, and measurable steps to address civilian harm humanitarian uh, suffering, and the safety of aid workers. He made clear that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action on these steps. He underscored as well that an immediate ceasefire is essential to stabilize and improve the humanitarian situation and protect innocent civilians, and he urged Prime Minister Netanyahu to empower his negotiators to conclude a deal without delay to bring the hostages home. After the phone call between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu, Israel committed to opening more aid routes into Gaza, saying it will use the Ashdod port for the direct delivery of assistance and will open a crossing to allow aid to reach the northern part of the territory. Israel also will significantly increase the amount of deliveries from Jordan into Gaza. No timetable spelled out yet. However, according to a White House National Security Council spokesperson, the steps announced by Israel, quote, must now be fully and rapidly implemented. So, uh, Joe, another intense phone call, uh, this time between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu, all, of course, coming on the heels of that awful tragedy where seven aid workers were killed. We had one of the ministers, the foreign mayor of Jerusalem, on our show yesterday. Uh, didn't seem terribly sympathetic to what had happened, said it was a, quote, mistake, but wanted to focus on other things and continue the war there. But it's clear now from the White House there will be conditions, perhaps, going forward on aid from the United States to Israel. Right. And, and he wanted to talk about the hostages. And, of course, that's great. Uh, wanted to ignore the fact that uh, the Gazan people are facing famine, uh, extraordinary hardship, um, and wanted to talk about Hamas, as do we. We all uh, agree that uh, Hamas, and we've always believed uh, Hamas, uh, we're a group of terrorist thugs. That, but that separates us from Benjamin Netanyahu, who, again, it can't be said enough. Benjamin Netanyahu saw Hamas as a political ally for years. Benjamin Netanyahu was the response was responsible for the funding of that terrorist organization for years. Benjamin Netanyahu told Qatar to give tens of millions of more dollars to Hamas weeks before the attack, the worst attack on Jews since the Holocaust. So for those, and I've heard it for, for the past, read it for the past 16, 18 hours since this phone call, for those saying, oh, but what about Hamas? How could Joe Biden not talk about Hamas? Why doesn't Joe Biden see Hamas as a real enemy here? He does. But that's what separates Richard Haas, Joe Biden from Benjamin Netanyahu. Joe Biden never saw Hamas as an ally. Benjamin Netanyahu did. And those who are attacking Joe Biden for stepping in and actually trying to help Israel, help itself, they, they, they claim to be right-wing supporters of Israel. In fact, they're just like a parent that wants to shove candy down a diabetic child's throat. What they are doing, what they are suggesting, hurts Israel in the short run and in the long run. And they knew it. And they knew it. And I would love to see all the editorials talking about how much damage this is doing to the standing of Israel in America, in the West, and across the world. Because, because, Unlike what the Wall Street Journal editorial page says this morning, this is not coming 
from left-wing anti-Israel factions. This is coming from, in my case, cons a conservative pro-Israeli faction, and the president's case, a very pro-Israeli uh, uh, Democrat. Uh, there are those of us who actually want Israel to be protected from the damage that Benjamin Netanyahu is inflicting on the Gazan people and on the Israeli people and on the families of the hostages and on Israel's long-term standing health and strength in the world community. Yeah, this whole phrase, pro-Israel, is uh, actually makes it almost impossible to have a serious conversation. The idea that if you're critical of Israeli government policy, the most right-wing government in Israel's history, the government, as you said, that for years green-lighted support to Hamas simply to divide and conquer the Palestinian political uh, movement, the government that was asleep at the switch on October 7th, if somehow you criticize them, then that makes you anti-Israel? And what, if you give them blanket support, that makes you pro-Israel, even if, as you say, a lot of what they're doing is harmful to the relationship between Israel and its most important backer, the, the United States? So certain terms like, you know, pro-Israel and the rest, let's, let's just put those to, to the side. I think the real test now going forward, Joe, after the phone call is, what did the Israelis take from this? Yes, they've slightly opened the spigots on food aid, why it took them so long, we can put that conversation to the side right now. Well, well no, no, I, I don't want to put that conversation to his, uh, the side. Okay. Is it, it is increasingly looking like Benjamin Netanyahu uh, had a plan uh, to, to force famine on, on the Palestinian people, on the Gazan people, to amp up the pressure on Hamas. Of course, it seems to me that the hostages aren't even secondary uh, in, in his mind, uh, because... Of course, and people say, well, Hamas could release hostages. Yeah, yeah, they could. They're terrorists. They're terrorists. They're not going to release the hostages and, it, 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 unless the conditions are right, which the conditions most likely are a ceasefire and the allowing of the, the worst terrorists to escape out of Gaza with their lives. But, but this whole idea that, that if we starve the Gazan people... That's going to somehow help Israel in the long run? That's going to help the hostages? No! Now that's hurting the hostages, it's hurting Israel. And of course, you're, you're, you're starving women and children in Gaza. And as Caddy said yesterday, they're now having to grind up dog food and cat food and, and, and eat that and, and drink salt water. I mean, it, 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 it's savage conditions. And it's calculated. And let me say, it's calculated just like Stalin's starvation of, of, of Ukrainians was calculated. This is calculated by Benjamin Netanyahu. And somebody needs to ask me why the hell the United States shouldn't intervene with a guy that has a 20 percent approval rating and knows that when the war is over, he could be going to jail. This, what's, what you're seeing from Israeli policy, I would argue, is truly misguided. There's been, I think let's we'll just call it what it is, a siege on Gaza, as you say. But in these kinds of situations, we've learned our, from the American experience in the Middle East, you've, you know, the old argument, you've got to try to win the hearts and minds. And what's so striking to me about Israeli policy is there's been nothing to win over the people. You see the siege on humanitarian supplies. You see the fact that maybe 18 or 20,000 civilians have been killed, not to mention the 200 aid workers. You see settlement activity, land expropriation continuing. You see no introduction of any ideas politically that would offer a political alternative to the violence of Hamas. So how is this supposed to end well? Does, does Israel seriously think it can somehow militarily alone destroy Palestinian nationalism as, as manifested by Hamas, and that's going to do it? So what's, what's striking to me is both what Israel is doing, Joe, and how it's doing it, but also what it's not doing. This is a policy that I would say is doomed to fail. You know, um, Jonathan, uh, we have always said that that those chanting from the river to the sea uh not i won't say i'll say it myself are talking about driving israel into sea into the sea it is an anti-semitic chant it is an anti-israeli chant sadly 
that's where Benjamin Netanyahu has, has come. I mean, he now is taking a position, and the extremists in his government are taking the position of from the river to the sea. This is all Israel. The Gazans need to leave. We're going to, to continue to steal land from the Palestinians in the West Bank. We're going to continue driving Palestinians off their own land. Benjamin Netanyahu and these extremists now say all, all, all of the land is theirs. The West Bank, Gaza, everything, the Palestinians need to leave. Let me tell you something. The Trump administration thought that they could get Middle East peace uh, by, cutting, by cutting the Palestinians out. I thought it was a preposterous idea at the time. I was glad to see uh, some Arab nations making peace with Israel. But their calculation was, we can buy off these countries. We can give them something that they want. And all the Arab countries hate the Palestinians anyway, so they'll be glad to cut the Palestinians out of the peace deal. That was the calculation. You can't cut the Palestinians out. We've seen what happens when you try to pretend they don't exist. And this is the fantasy world that Benjamin Netanyahu is living in. And why should Americans that don't give a damn about the Middle East care about it? Because it impacts us. Because we are Israel's uh, guarantor. Mm -hmm. Not just militarily, but we guarantee their existence. And if we're going to guarantee their existence like we have since 1948, then we need a partner that is going to act responsibly and it's going to understand there has to be a two-state solution. And now they've moved away from There's a no two-state solution. Well, that's just not going to work. And the United States can't continue as Israel's partner if there's not going to be a two-state solution because we're going to see war for another, what, 60, 70, 80 years, and we're going to be in the middle of it. So this is a story that I, I think is so important, uh, and it's been flying under the radar, I think, for a lot of uh, uh, politicians, pollsters. I remember having a conversation a few weeks ago with a pollster uh, who couldn't figure out why there was a, a, a growing divide between young men and young women politically, uh, with, with men breaking, young men breaking far more to the right than young women. Well, according to a recent uh, analysis by The Economist, data shows that in many rich countries, younger women are becoming sharply more liberal while their male peers are not. The divide is evident here in the United States as well. The latest Wall Street Journal poll finds that President Biden draws only 37 percent in men in the seven swing states on the ballot that includes only him and Trump. Those are far weaker showings than the 46% of men that Biden won in the 2020 election. In 2020, Biden won 55% of women and 46% of men, a gap of nine points in the Journal's national and swing state polls. That gap's now at 13 points, due mostly to his deteriorating support among uh, men. Um, you know, and Willie, this is something that I remember in 2017, 2018, talking to the, uh, a friend who was the head of, of school at uh, one of the most elite prep schools in America and, and saying from just what I was picking up from, from these campuses, these elite campuses, whether it was prep schools or colleges, I said to him, I said, listen, you have to understand something. If you keep pushing young boys, young men into the corner, telling them, uh, you know, that they're toxic or are, are just suggesting they're guilty because they're men, you shove them into that corner, I promise you, they're going to come out Trumpers. This is, this is whatever you think you're doing, whatever wrongs you think you were writing, you're actually doing just the opposite. And you are going to strengthen Donald Trump and you're going to strengthen people like Donald Trump with these actions. Well, he smiled, we remained friends, and of course he and everybody else did absolutely nothing. And it's not just in elite prep schools, Willie, and elite colleges, even though that's happening there, not as much, I think, as it was a few years ago. But 
you've seen it just like so many other New York City parents have. Yeah, I mean, if you tell young boys and young men that they're toxic, that they're in some way inherently bad, at some point they begin to resent that and look for a place that's not telling them that. In fact, is, is saying the opposite. So there is, it's such a complicated and fascinating issue, and I'm so glad we're doing this segment because there is something about um, recapturing some old version of masculinity that Donald Trump and podcasters and a certain culture in this country that is really putting its finger on and trying to convince uh, men and young men that they, they, they can help bring us back to that place. But then there's also the other side of it, which is pushing uh, men away in many ways. And there are so many inequities and inequalities in terms of gender that need to be righted over centuries and centuries. And we're on our way to doing better with that, I hope. But I don't think you have to do I think you can do two things at once, as we say on this show. You can lift people up without pushing the other gender down. Let's continue this conversation with the deputy editor of The Economist, lead author of the piece we just mentioned, Robert Guest. Robert, good morning. It's great to have you on. In the piece for The Economist, titled Why Young Men and Women Are Drifting Apart, you write about why we're seeing such divergent priorities between the sexes. And you write in part, the most likely causes of this growing division are education. Young men are getting less of it than young women experience. Advanced countries have become less sexist and men and women experience this differently. And echo chambers, social media aggravate polarization. Also, in democracies, many politicians on the right are deftly stoking young male grievances, while many on the left barely acknowledge young men have real problems. But they do, starting with education. Although the men at the top are doing fine, many of the rest are struggling. In rich countries, 28% of boys and only 18% of girls fail to reach the minimum level of reading proficiency, and women have overtaken men at university. So, um, Robert, where do you start looking at this trend? What's the source of this? Because, as you say, it was equal for many, many years and seems to have gone in a different direction in recent. So what will you start by is, is remembering this is not just an American problem. This is something we're seeing all around uh, rich and, and developed countries, you know, places as different as, as sort of Poland, America, France, South Korea, China. Um, and, and then you've got to look at what's changed. And we were very, very careful not to exaggerate this. We got our data team to look very carefully at the highest quality polling and how it had changed over time. Uh, and we found that the, the gap, uh, if, you, if you put yourself on a, a scale of sort of, you know, one to 10 from sort of very liberal to very conservative, um, 20 years ago, there was basically no difference between young men and women. That's sort of 18 to 29 year olds across the 20 rich countries that we looked at. But now the gap is about uh, 0.75. And that may not sound very much, but, you know, most people cluster around the middle. It's actually a very big gap. It's about twice as large as the gap between people who went to college and people who didn't go to college. And, you know, people who go to college tend to skew much more liberal. And in America, the gap's double the average. It's 1.4. That's, that's very big. And that suggests that people are hearing a different account of reality. Um, and it's, you know, we think it's partly because, you know, men are more likely to be doing badly uh, in education. Uh, and that affects them in the job market. And that affects them in the dating market. And some of them, a minority, but a significant minority, are blaming women for the fact that they're not doing very well in the job market and the dating market. And then when you add social media to that, um, everyone's in these echo chambers. So, you know, if you're if you're female and you look at a Me Too story, you're going to be served up more Me Too stories. If you're a guy and you look at a story about someone being falsely accused of rape, you're going to be served up more stories like that. And this gives you um, a greatly exaggerated view of the risks that you personally face. Um, and that's very polarizing. So, Robert, I wrote quite a lot about this in a book I wrote last year, The Power Code, um, and we looked at this thing called loss aversion theory, the idea that men, young men in particular, felt that they were losing out and that that caused resentment. They didn't see the pie growing. They felt there was a sort of theory that, you know, if women were getting on better, that must mean they were getting on worse. I mean, I'm not entirely sure women are getting on that much better because there's just been a report out this week showing the number of women in C-suites in America, anyway, has declined for the first time in a while, so perhaps every, everybody's losing out. But one of the political theories that I'd heard posited was that uh, women, because women have been at the kind of losing end of power structures until fairly recently, 
when they start getting into power, they retain more empathy for immigrants or for people lower down the scale. They tend to have more support, understandably, for sort of DEI initiatives and stuff. And that tends to actually push women more to the left. So it's not just that men are going more to the right, it's that women are becoming more liberal. And I wanted you to talk about that side of the equation. What's happening there? Um, this is about how people express their, their sort of political allegiance. And I think, you know, generally speaking, younger generations are more liberal than older generations. But there's also a tendency to take for granted all the progress that's happened in the past and understandably to focus on the things that still need correcting. So, you know, nobody, it's not an issue anymore whether, you know, women are allowed to enter the legal profession, which was a, you know, really big deal back in the 1960s. Um, things like sort of marital rape have been criminalized everywhere, um, certainly in, in rich countries. So people tend to take for granted the progress of the past, which has been considerable, um, and, and focus on the problems that they're facing in the future. And for, for women, that means you're focusing on things like the, you know, imbalance in the C-suite, which is still very large. But, you know, when, when young men who haven't been to college hear about that and they're told, well, you know, you shouldn't be complaining because, you know, the C-suites are almost entirely male, they're like, yeah, but that's, that's other men. That's not us. Um, you know, we're the guys who are struggling to make a living. And so people do tend to focus uh, on their, their own issues, understandably. Um, and, and like I said, with social media, they tend to get an exaggerated view of, of how bad things are for them and how likely really bad things are to happen to them. So, you know, some of the interviews we did. Yeah. And Susan, your latest speech for The New Yorker is titled Donald Trump's Amnesia Advantage gets at what you were just talking about. Susan writes in part, the American presidency is the ultimate easy target, whether high gas prices due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine or post-pandemic inflation at the grocery store. Biden absorbed the outrage while the mitigating steps taken by his administration have not redounded to his credit. Susan continues, the incumbency bind is a real problem for Biden in 2024. So, too, is the political amnesia powering the increasingly absurd arguments from Trump and his enablers about how he'd better handle everything from Israel and Ukraine to the border. Forgetting Trump's own memory lapses and those of the broader electorate is one of the former president's political superpowers. You could add to that list, and I know you write about this too, Susan, January 6th, the rewriting of history around that, what he did around the 2020 election. Donald Trump, still sort of like he did in 2016, wants to be the white knight riding in to save a country in decline, forgetting the fact that he was right there in the middle of it for four years, adding to it. Yeah, I'm pretty blown away. When you look at some of these numbers, uh, it is just extraordinary. It's as if the, the country, a, a large part of the country has lost its collective mind, really. I mean, you know, you see Donald Trump going up in polls on every sort of criteria. For example, leadership qualities. Uh, you know, is he capable of managing the country well in a crisis? It's, it's, it's literally like did all of America just sleep through 2020? Did they forget this? And what I'm struck by is that it's across the board. We're talking about Israel right now. And increasingly, I hear, as I'm sure you do from many people, especially many young people who are not even fans of Donald Trump, well, what really is the difference between the two parties? I mean, what is the difference between Joe Biden and Donald Trump? And I, I think, how is it even possible that this is the conversation we're having uh, in 2024? It's, it's, it's a remarkable thing. But I think you have to look at uh, memory itself as on the ballot in uh, in our elections this fall. Caddy, it is extraordinary, this phenomenon of Trump amnesia. The, you know, it's been written about. There's been some studies about it and certainly just day-to-day -day conversations. People are like, oh, no, it wasn't that bad. Or, oh, this happened. Then. It's like, no. And, and people don't remember. So my question to you is, what challenge does this pose us as journalists? You know, in terms of reminding people, providing necessary context, fact checking, because when you do so, you're often accused by the other side, in this case, Republicans, conservatives, in, in a bad faith way of being biased. Well, why are you talking about January 6th all the time? Why are you talking about well, this? Why are you doing this? You're just trying to sway people's opinions. So what's the right what's the right approach here? Oh, God, I, I wish I wish I had the answer. I mean, I really do, because I think this Donald Trump has always been one of the most tricky um, politicians, if we call him that, 
figures to cover. I mean, right from 2015 when he came down the escalator and he got a huge amount of attention, a huge amount of free airtime, partly because he was new, he was newsworthy, right? He was a different kind of politician. He was someone running for the presidency who had never been elected before, who said extraordinary things that were right outside of the political mainstream. And then I think after he left office, part of the reason for the amnesia was that we'd gone through four years of of government by chaos. I mean, that was the way Trump operated. It was, for all of us journalists who covered it every day, it was sort of exhausting. And I think for the country, there was that as well. I mean, poll after poll showed us that people were exhausted by the Trump presidency. Even people who were big supporters of Donald Trump found it very tiring and found found the level of exhaustion high. So perhaps that's why people wanted to forget. We just, you know, we didn't want to go back to thinking about all that tiredness and the stress of, of covering that time. And I think today we're facing, look, you know, MSNBC and NBC have just gone through this own version of this questioning with the hiring and then the firing of Ronald McDaniel. How do we cover, how do we give voice to the dissatisfaction that people who support Donald Trump feel in a legitimate, respectful way whilst also calling out lies around something like an election that was not stolen and uh, people who went to prison after January the 6th because they committed crime. So I think we just have to be clear in our own mind and in every case treat every single incident on its own merits um, and is this truth, is this not truth in a world of disinformation that becomes even harder whilst not dismissing millions of people's grievances who have legitimate grievances and things they're unhappy about who may vote for Donald Trump. President Biden will travel to Baltimore today to receive an operational update on the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse and to meet with the families of the victims. Since that accident last Tuesday, crews have begun working to clear the wreckage and the federal government has provided about $60 million in relief to Maryland. President Biden has been pushing for Congress to fully foot the bill to rebuild the bridge as the Port of Baltimore, of course, is a major hub for the American economy. Joining us now from Baltimore, Maryland's Democratic Governor, Wes Moore. Governor Moore, it's great to have you back with us this morning. Um, what does it look like now about 10 days on since that tragic accident on the bridge when the fully loaded cargo ship hit it, it collapsed in those overnight hours? How is the recovery? How is the cleanup going? Well, I think the state is still mourning. Uh, you know, we still have uh, four souls that are unaccounted for, and, and uh, we are all committed to making sure we can bring a sense of closure uh, and comfort to these families who are, who are living a nightmare. Uh, and we also know that we have seen a maritime disaster uh, that's unprecedented, uh, a ship that is literally the size of the Eiffel Tower and the weight of the Washington Monument that's now sitting in the middle of the Patapsco River with a bridge, an iconic bridge sitting on top of it and about 27,000 tons of wreckage that is now sitting in the water. Uh, but we also know that we've since seen a measure of resilience uh, and a measure of, of, of collective resolve that has been inspiring by the people of this state. And so I think we continue to see when we say Maryland tough and Baltimore strong, we have folks every single day who are showing exactly what that means and what it looks like. Governor, good morning. Good to see you. We expect to hear from President Biden later today. He'll call for full federal funding of this repair work. Uh, please weigh in and, and you give us your thoughts on that. But secondly, secondarily, give us a timetable, if you will, I, I, not for the rebuilding of the bridge, which I know is going to be quite lengthy, but just clearing the wreckage there of the boat and the debris. When can that be removed so the port can open again? Well, so we've been grateful that the, the Biden administration has been with us uh, every step of the way. I think I got my first phone call from the White House at three o'clock in the morning, uh, the morning of the of the tragedy. And it has been consistent throughout where they have continued to walk this path with us. And the thing that we know is that we are going to we're going to need it because this is not just something that's impacting Baltimore. It's not just something that's impacting the state of Maryland. Uh, the port of Baltimore is responsible for 70 billion dollars annually. Uh, we are looking at a port that is the largest port for agricultural equipment, the largest port for new cars, the largest port for heavy trucks, the largest ports for spices and sugars. So this is not just impacting Marylanders. This is impacting the farmer in Kentucky. It's impacting the auto dealer in Ohio. It's impacting the restaurant owner in Tennessee. It's impacting the entire country on our economic growth. And the complexity of this operation is significant. You know, we have divers who are going down there. We've been running a 24-7 operation.
ocean. And we have divers who are going down and cannot see any further than a foot or two in front of them because of the amount of wreckage that is still very much in the water. And so we know that this is not just a rallying cry for the state of Maryland. This really is a rallying cry for the country. And so that level of support is going to be important. We know that the, uh, the, uh, the, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers have indicated that we are hoping to be able to continue opening up channels. Uh, I was amazed that in the first week we were able to open up two channels for smaller vessels and boats and tugs that can now enter into the area, starting to get our commercial activity back going again. While we know it's going to be a long journey, uh, and, uh, and the Army Corps of Engineers have indicated that they are hoping that we can have channels up to 35 foot depth open within uh, within a month, we know it's going to take everything, everything, all hands on deck in order to accomplish that. But we know we're prepared to give just exactly that. Governor, thousands of Marylanders, of course, cross that bridge every day and their jobs depend on crossing that bridge in many cases. Just give us a sort of sense of what has happened to their lives, their daily routines uh, since the bridge went down. You're absolutely right, Caddy. Uh, uh, over 36,000 people would cross that bridge every single day. Uh, and so our Maryland Department of Transportation uh, has been, been working around the clock to create alternative routes, being able to utilize areas like 95 and 895 to get people from where they live to where they work, where they worship, where they, where they go to school. Uh, and so while, while we've been able to create these alternative lanes and alternative uh, avenues of traffic, uh, we know that we're also asking patience for the people of this state. And it does bring up a much larger point about critical infrastructure. You know, the highest priority that I have as a chief executive is to make sure that our people are safe and to make sure that we're moving in a coordinated fashion to ensure safety for all of our people. And that includes critical infrastructure. And so I think this is just a, a continued uh, evolution that we have got to do to make sure that we have multiple pathways, multiple modal transportation assets for people to go from where they live to where they work. That's also going to help to get an economic engine going and making sure that economic growth can be participatory and not exclusionary. All right. We hope they can get back up and running. And in the meantime, as you say, our thoughts are with those six families mourning the loss of loved ones this week again. Maryland Governor Wes Moore, we always appreciate your time. Thanks for being here this morning. God bless you guys and thank you. Thanks, Governor. Still Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.